All right, let's get into this. This is my Bible. It is Yah's Word. It is the inspired and fallible Word of Yah. It is a lamp unto my feet. Blessed are those who hear the Word of Yah and keep it. I find out who I am in the pages contained herein. This is my Bible. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? I'm doing well as well. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, we have not had a controversial message in a little bit but this would be a good controversy because all controversy is good if it's all in scripture right as long as it's scripture i know that somebody is prepared to take this down if it isn't but today's message is titled the god of all gods last time i was before you i did a message on the king of all kings because that's who we refer to the son as correct and then we went through the genealogy on how the majority of the people in his family line were, in fact, kings and rulers. So let's look at our principal verse, and then we will splinter on from there. So we're going to start off in Deuteronomy chapter 10, 14 through 17. And I'm going to read this just as it is written in the NIV. This is how you know most people talk. To the Lord your God belong the heavens. Even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, and accepts no bribes. So this is Moses getting instruction from the Most High, right? Amen. So first of all, the phrasing that is used here of God of gods and Lord of lords is only used twice in Scripture. And we're going to look at the other usage in one second. So he is the God of all gods, correct? Because we can see that that's what Moses got. So we can agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. We're not disagreeing with Scripture. All right, was, nobody, everybody's like, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> Let's look at the other verse that it is used. Psalm 136, 1 through 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endureth forever. That's one of my favorite songs that the church is singing. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. This author of this psalm, just like everywhere else in Scripture, is quoting the Torah. He's quoting Deuteronomy. The author of this song is King David. He wrote this as an assignment for the Levites who worked in the temple for them to praise the Most High. So again... We hear, we see here that the Most High is referred to as the God above other gods. You guys still with me? I don't want to lose you early. But, you know people always side-eye me when I go on and on about the law, the Torah, the Old Testament. Let's go to everybody's favorite person in the American church. And unfortunately, it's not Jesus, it's Paul. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 13 through 15. I was being facetious about saying Paul is everyone's favorite. But people love to quote Paul to get to make room for whatever they want to do. So, in the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So we see here that Paul referring to God the Father as the Lord of lords. In the Greek, the karios of karionton, which is the master of masters, the person above all that is above all. 
Paul is talking about God the Father, but we also know that the Son has this title as well. Do we not? Mm-hmm. All right, let's go to it for the people that don't. Revelation 17, 14. They will wage war against the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus. All right, yes, we should know because the L is capitalized. But the Lamb will triumph over them. So again, this goes against this picture that we have of this meek and weak Jesus that's just all love and peace. You know, he turned Jesus into a hippie, basically. But they said they're going to wage war against him. The only way to fight war is to fight. Is there was no nice war. There's no tickling contest or anything like that. And what? who wins the battle? The hippie won. The hippie wins the battle. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Because he's a fighter. The lamb will triumph over them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Yes, yes, yes. So we know how he's the king of kings. In Revelation 19, verse 16, when it is talking about the rider on the white horse, and we know this is to be the Messiah because we taught this for decades here at this church. And it says that this writer's name is the word of God, the word of Yah, the action of the Most High. But in verse 16, it says that this writer has a name written on his banner that reads King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, there's some worldly people and some worldly Christians that will say that Jesus had a tattoo and that he had his name on him because they want to. And I'm not being anti tattoo, but don't bring Jesus into why it's okay to get a tattoo. Just say you want to get one. Don't don't you don't have to bring Jesus into it. I don't think Jesus won the tattoo part. I'll get it right here. I wanted to say Mary right here. Get it on my chest. Say Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I've got some tied across my stomach like Nas does. Who's Nas? <laughs> so we all have all of these references of God the Father and God the Son being supreme. Amongst other gods, because if you say someone is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, what does that mean? What what relation does that put them against the other lords and gods? He's above. We understand that, right? All right. Uh, I'm glad I haven't lost y'all yet. But how can you be above other gods if there are no other gods? Got quiet on that one. For the people listening to the recording, there are, in fact, people here. We are not a mega church, but there are people in here. <laughs> in the Abrahamic faiths, they call the belief that we have, so that's for people that follow Judaism, Christianity, and is- Islam, they say that we have a monotheistic faith, which means that we only believe in one God. Everybody following still? Amen. But the interesting thing is, Scripture never says that. Scripture never says that there's only one God. Because how can it be one God if someone is above other gods? The God contradicts, right? And does the Bible contradict itself? Nope. No. But man does. Amen. Man does a great job at that. Scripture is full of other gods. So first of all, This is why I don't use the word God anymore because it is confusing and lacks the nature and power of Yah's name. I'm not saying you won't go to hell, or or, excuse me, that you won't go to heaven, or that your prayers won't get answered if you don't use the correct name because that has no bearing on it. Our faith is what activates things, correct? Because we know the story about when Jesus went to his hometown. Was he able to do many miracles there? And those people knew his name to the dialect. They could call in his name and he would turn around. There was no wrong translations because they grew up with him. So they knew his name, but they still didn't get no miracles done. So I'm not one of those people that are saying we're a cult or we're misled because we don't use the name. It's our faith. But this is why I don't ever say God because it doesn't tell the whole story. God just means deity. A deity is just a powerful being, a non-human with power or a ruler of power. So it gets too bogged down when we just lessen it to just three letters that mean nothing. 
Now we're gonna get, we are gonna get somewhere. All right. So, in Greek mythology, you probably learned this in middle school. There is a place called Mount Olympus where all the gods come to. Now I always say that with myths, there is truth in the beginning. All myths have an inkling of truth where they come from. For an example, when you think about every culture has myths about fire-breathing reptiles, correct? There's dragons that breathe fire, right? Yeah. Like uh, in ancient, in Asian culture, they have fire-breathing dragons. There's no stories in any culture about fire-breathing zebras or fire-breathing hippos or fire-breathing elephants, right? There is always a fire-breathing reptile. And we know from nature that there are reptiles that can bring forth acidic spit that burns. So there is an inkling of truth in the mythology. But let's go and find Mount Olympus in Scripture. It should be easy to find, should it not? A mountain where deities meet, right? Right? Because that's what happens in Greek mythology. So let's go to Ezekiel 28. Oh. I didn't change it. I have it here. You need to not be lazy anyway. <laughs> that was all a plan. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. You, and this is, um, this is them talking about who we know as Satan. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. So we have a mountain where the deities meet. He says, you were there. You were the one. You were that guy. And we're going to talk about that guy in a moment in, in detail. So we know that we are talking about Satan here. And Yah is saying that he was a guardian cherub and he was on the holy mount of Yah. We have these deities, these gods, meeting on a mountain together. Right? Another example of this would be in the book of Job, where the angels go and present themselves before Yah. And who was there with the angels? On oh, Mount Olympus. <laughs> presenting himself. And having a cordial conversation with Yah. That isn't how we get the depiction of God and the devil, is it? Of them just having a cordial conversation. Told you it was going to be controversial today. These angels are lowercase gods based off of our human knowledge and interaction. Because we can't explain the supernatural. So to us, Oh, it's a God. Look at what it can do. It has special powers. Because in our, especially back then when there was no te the technology we have today, there's no Avengers on screen. Like, they're just, whoa, look at that dude. He's made of fire. <laughs> look what that dude did. Each angel is in charge of something. And then mankind being so desperate to worship something, started to worship these deities. The fallen angels. Not because every time they tried to do an offering to one of the good angels, quote unquote, the quote unquote was on angels, they were like, no, no, no. Don't praise me. I'm just like you. I got to praise him. But the bad ones were like, yeah, praise on to me. We're going to talk about that too. Oh, we're going somewhere today. And this will all line up with scripture. So you don't think I'm making stuff up and making stuff fit. As it always does. And you may think I'm just putting, making this stuff up or making it fit together. But when you look at Greek mythology and Roman mythology, they worship these deities that are in charge of one aspect. This is where the... Uh, so, we have uh, Aphrodite. In the Greek, in Venus, in Roman, they're the goddess of beauty. There are some other cool ones that we know. Ares and Mars, the god of war. 
Uh, Ephesus and Vulcan, the god of blacksmiths, Hermes and Mercury, the messenger of the gods. So this, see how, we're going too far. Go to, calm down and refocus. The same deities, the same gods are in charge of the same thing. They just have different names because they speak a different language. But that same entity came and talked to him, said, hey, I'm this. Praise me. They're masquerading as gods and getting man to worship them and sacrifice them. Let's go back to Paul. What's the next verse I have up here? So even when we go to Egyptian mythology from Greek, there still is the same, it's still the same lineup because they talk a different language. So these angels, these lowercase gods, are getting man to worship them. Because how could it be three separate cultures have the exact same deity to worship for the same exact thing? Unless they were all getting a vision from the same deity. I mean, it lines up in scripture. In scripture, they had, the, they had Mammon. They had all these. They had Dagon. They had all these different ones that had man worship them. Man can't just make something. Of, this is what the God looks like. This is what he does. What? What's the next verse we have? In Ephesians chapter 6, because Paul speaks about this explicitly. But because of our horrible language, the English language, we don't understand what's really being said until we actually look at and look some words up. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12, finally, Amen. be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take sand against the devil's schemes. So he's talking to a church when he writes this, correct? And he said, hey, the devil, his cohorts are going to be after you. You need some armor. Because you don't put on armor to just sit down and watch TV. You put on armor to what? To fight. For our struggle, for our fight, Verse 12, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's not against your baby daddy. It's not against none of that. It's not against your kids. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Somebody say heavenly realms. Heavenly realms. That's a big hint right there, but we're going to go deeper into it. So our battle is not against people, but against rulers, authorities, and powers. Who are they? I'm glad you asked. They are deities. They are lowercase gods. When you look at the orders of angels, you can see that there's a group that are called the rulers. Sorry. Sorry. Let me go through the whole thing. So there's a lower group called angel, and then we call everything angels, right? Mm -hmm. But that's only one group. That's the group that goes and visits someone to communicate with them. In the, in the Hebrew, it's called melech. There's someone that's just talking. They look like a man. They don't have, they're not <laughs> extravagant. They just appear, and they say, hey, you're about to have a child. Name your child this. You're, you're going the wrong way. Go that way. Then you have the archangels, like, like Michael, the ones with the swords, the ones that are ready to fight. That's what they do. You don't call them to come watch the basketball game. You call them for a fight. The principalities and the rulers are part of the same group. And then you can see there's a group called powers. So those are the three. And then what group was Satan part of? I just read it in Ezekiel. His group is, is one of the top ones. The cherubim. And I, Darren's not making this up. Ezekiel said this. If you would disagree with me, go holla at Ezekiel. Go holla at Zeke. <laughs> he was a cherubim. He was a part of the group that was constantly in the presence of the Most High. 
constantly there, never left. Now, this may be news to some of you, but Satan or Lucifer, or better yet, the shining one, had a very important job in heaven as the anointed cherub. What's another word for anointed? Messiah. That's another one. We won't go that far into it. <laughs> in heaven, the shining one was the high priest for the other deities. How do I know that? Because I read the Bible. Yo, you want to know too? I'll show you. Sure. Let's go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. You, again talking about the shining one, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That sounds like a nice little love poem right there. Bars. Right, bars. You were in the gar you were in Eden, the garden of Yah. Every precious stone adorned you. This is the key part. Carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. He has some bling. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. These didn't exist until you were created. These precious, uh, amazing, priceless gems did not exist until you were created. Now, I know that for those who do not remember me going over this or never heard it, they feel that it is not enough to prove that the shining one is the high priest in heaven. But I will show you that it, in fact, is enough evidence for that. Because let's look at when Yah gave instructions to what the high priest was supposed to wear. Ex Exodus chapter 28, 15 through 20. Fashion a breast piece for making decisions, the work of skilled hands. Make like it the ephod of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet yarn. And, and it finely twist in linen. It is to be square, a span long, and a span wide, and folded double. Then mount four rows of precious stones on it. The first row shall be carnelian, chrysolite, and beryl. The second row shall be turquoise, lapis, lazuli, and emerald. The third row shall be jacinth, agati, and amethyst. The fourth row shall be topaz, onyx, and jasper. Mount them in gold fil filigree settings. So, doesn't that sound familiar what we just read? These precious things that never existed until the shining one was created. And he said, put this on your high priest. Nine of the same jewels are adorned on the high priest the same way they were adorned on the shining one. Now we get the word Latin word Lucifer, which means bringer of light, but he didn't create light. That's why he calling the shining one, not the bringer of night, not Lucifer. But this high priest, because what is a high priest's job to do in the temple? He's the only one that can go in, right? We know that from studying about how the, the priest did, right? So the high priest, he goes in to the temple and he would take the glory of Yah and Yah's reflection would be on the nine jewels of his body. And he would go out the temple and he would shine them and magnify them because he's the shining one. Because he has these precious gems on him. And he would shine them and show them to the other deities. And the other deities would see him, see the reflection of Yah's glory. And they would bow. Hallelujah. Because they're like, that's the most high. He's, that's his glory. We get to see it. And the shining one made it brighter, because that's his job. He didn't create the light, he just made it brighter. The shining one felt that he could elevate his throne above the throne of the Most High. Now notice that it said he would elevate his throne and not make a throne, because those are two different things, aren't they? 
He already had a throne that he said, my throne should be above earth. So you see how nice I look? But you only got that because of me. You're biting the hand that's feeding you. But he already had a throne based off of the book of Isaiah. Chapter 14, 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, the shining one. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of Yah. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. Oh, look at that, Mount Olympus again. On the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon, I will ascend above the top of the clouds and will make myself like the Most High. I want to be the one that shines. I want to be the originator of it. And what did a third of those other deities, a third of those other stars do? They were like, yeah, you should. I agree with you. Let's go. And then we know the archangels, Michael, was like, oh, that's, that's what we own? Right. I've been waiting to knock you out. <laughs> but notice it says that he was going to raise his current throne above that one. So we know that the shining one has a throne and he is adorned with the ephod, with the nine stones. Why would the Most High have the high priests on earth wear the same breastplate that Satan wears? Unless that breastplate has priestly meaning. On earth as it is in heaven. He has rules. He doesn't break his rules. The shining one broke the rules. He's like, well, that's his fault. I have this, I decide design these gems to have special meaning. Yes, this dude fell, but the people I have a covenant with, they're still going to wait. And I'm about to add three more to him as well. Just like on earth that is it, as it is in heaven, just like the festivals and the holy days, we will be doing those in heaven. Because, it, like I said, another word for what those festivals are called would be a rehearsal. We are going to practice Passover in heaven. We're going to practice all of we're going to have practice all of those things that he declared in heaven. That's why he brought them to us. And it says he was in the garden. We also know that he was the seal of protection and he wanted to elevate his throne above Yah's throne. And in Matthew chapter 4, when he tempts the Messiah with all the kingdoms of the world. How is he able to do that? How is he able to give somebody something unless it's his? Because I can't say, hey, uh, Pastor Dada, this is a nice challenger outside. It's real good. It's black. It's got some the tires. The rims are nice. It's re you look real good in it. Do I have the authority to have that conversation with him? No, it's not my car. He's able to do that because he is in charge of those kingdoms. Remember the rulers? Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. The rulers are an order of deities. Because again, angels just for messengers, it's nine different classifications of these heavenly beings. The rulers are in charge of who becomes in power. Now I know that my conservative friends will always say when people that they like to be in power, they will say, God made this person sinner. Or God made this person president. He appointed it. Scripture says the rulers did it. And I'm not saying conservatives as a liberal. I'm saying liberals will never say that because they'll never say, oh, yeah, God put that person in power. <laughs> the deities that our battle is against are in charge of who is in power over countries. If you notice in scripture, numerous times when they're talking about the devil or another negative being, they will use things like the prince of Persia, or they will say the king of Sidon. They will mention places because they're under a stronghold of that deity, of that God. 
Like these these, these lowercase gods appear to people. In the this isn't in my notes. In the Islamic faith, they believe that Muhammad had a vision with an angel. And in his writings, he says that it was the angel Gabriel. And we have to be mindful that we can't ever say that people weren't visited by beings. Because that's their own testimony. We don't have the authority to say, well, that person's lying. But if you ever research his encounter with the angel... It is very violent, and he tries to pull away, and the angel forces his head into a scroll and says, no, this is what you're reading, and this is what you're going to have. So not, I don't have the authority to say who's right or wrong, but deities visit people, and then they create gods. They create religions. They create everything. We just talked about Greek. For centuries, people follow Greek mythology, and made sacrifices to those lowercase gods because of their visits with them. Because nobody could, there would be no purpose for someone to make up a whole mythology to for them to sacrifice to other gods. That's because they were visited by those fallen angels that were in charge of those things. But again, in scripture, numerous times, the devil's referred to as the prince of Persia, the king of Saddam, because he is the one who put those people in power. Another group that our battle is against, they are in charge of teaching mankind the sciences. And now this is not to sound anti-science. I think science teaches us about Yah's creation all the time. The other deity gives man the arts. The same arts that have us dancing and singing along to disparaging music. The same arts that depict us stereotypically. So that is who our battle is against, according to the Apostle Paul, not according to Pastor Darren. I had us go over all of this so that we can see and we can know that our God is above all the other gods. Amen. Because it makes no sense with our alleged monotheism. Because if we believe in monotheism, how is he above anyone else? Because scripture says he's above other gods. So there has to be other gods. But he's the one above them all. We serve the living God that is above all of creation and the creation and the creator of the universe. Right. Those other gods never created anything. They just amplified or twisted or changed things. They never made anything. They presented, they handed things down to man, but they never gave man anything. Thank you, Father, for a blessing to the reading of the word.